As the center of American flight research, this iconic base in the Mojave Desert has served as the premier test and evaluation base across the aerospace industry. This weekend, we showcase the role science, technology, engineering, and math play in breaking tomorrow's barriers. The daring innovation that has enabled the United States Air Force to compete, deter, and win against our adversaries. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome in. Day two of this 2022 Aerospace Valley Air Show. Glad you're joining us wherever you might be. Live from Edwards Air Force Base. We're at Show Center. I'm Dan Hawkins from the Headquarters Air Education and Training Command Public Affairs Team. Delighted to be joined by Staff Sergeant Jordan Barron's from the 2nd Audiovisual Squad. And Jordan, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for letting me come hang out again, Dan. Yeah. We've got another beautiful day, a great day for a second air show. Uh, temperatures in the 80s, nice sunny skies, and I'm ready to get started. Yeah, and we've got a ton of aerial acts today, headlined, of course, by the aerial demonstration team. The ambassadors in blue, the Thunderbirds are here. Uh, that will no doubt delight what is expected to be a, a huge crowd on this Sunday. 13 years it's been since Edwards has been open uh, to visit the base for the air show. So it's going to be a huge crowd. You see the time lapse there, but it's going to fill in. And some of our spectators might notice the landscape here at Edwards. It's been used in lots of Hollywood movies like Iron Man and Captain Marvel. But if you can't make it out here today, we'll be broadcasting the whole show live. Yeah, great images all day long from our second audio visual squadron team. And 2022 also marks a major milestone for the United States Air Force. For 75 years, American airmen have innovated, accelerated, and thrived as they execute the Air Force mission to fly, fight, and win, delivering air power anytime, anywhere. And all around the country at air shows, at Air Force bases, including here at Edwards, there have been special events to mark that anniversary. And here, Jordan, the 75th anniversary of Chuck Yeager and the Bell X-1 team breaking the sound barrier. And General Matt Heiger, he's the commander here at Edwards, the 412 test wing. He's going to join us later, talk about a big announcement that they made in conjunction with that on Friday. But really cool. And the Air Force Test Center mission happens every single day. Let's take a look at what test really means. their best. So if you're here already or you're on your way, whatever you might be doing this morning, we hope that you're on your way here. But we have a parking map to show you what it looks like and how you can get onto the installation. Uh, and here's a look at that map. And the north and the west gates are your primary points of entry. Don't come to the south gate because you will get turned away. And if you have any confusion or any questions, you'll see some military members kind of along the road there. Feel free to stop and ask any questions, and maybe they can help direct you in the right place. Yeah. So. We also have some prohibited items, so some things that you cannot bring to the air show, and don't bring any of these things. Yeah, and again, <laughs> people are here to help you if you have any questions. If you have some confusion about this list or anything, just stop and ask. Always better to ask somebody than to try to bring something in that you can't. Yeah, big ones, of course, glass containers, no weapons, of course. Uh, don't bring your bike. Uh, you can't really ride it. There's too many people here yeah. anyway. So uh, lots to see and do in terms of static displays and even aircraft. So the Air Force Thunderbirds, of course, are the primary attraction. They're the headline act. They'll be on about 2.30 uh, Pacific time. But Jordan, there's a lot of other acts here to see uh, throughout the course of the next few hours. There's so much to see. You can see the schedule here. We've got a bunch of things lined up. A lot of other things, uh, like static displays, are here. There's a lot going on, and it's a really, really great thing to come out and see. Yeah, and this air show, and you pointed it out yesterday, it's the only air show in North America that will feature actual sonic booms. We heard about four or five yesterday, even 
when you were on set yesterday, Jordan, you about jumped out of your chair like three times. I still haven't got used to them. They did them the entire practice. They did them all day yesterday. And once it happens again today, you'll see me jump about 10 feet in the air. Yeah, so we will see that coming up very soon. In fact, earlier, some uh, F-16s, F-22s, and an F-35 took to the air for a combat uh, demonstration that will be coming up here in just a little bit so we're gonna get that to kick off the air show right now it's scheduled to kick off in about five minutes or so uh, 11 o'clock and so a b1 is also up in the air as well so get ready because we're about ready to get started and so the air show Brings out a wide and diverse crowd. The general uh, yesterday, uh, the commander here at Edwards, talked about STEM, as you see the C-17 uh, in the air. That's where the wings of blue will jump out of. Uh, that's a workhorse for the United States Air Force from an air mobility perspective. But, Jordan, I'm just curious, what do you want to see today? We've been here a couple days, but it's still hard to get out and see everything when you're working. So what is on your must-see list? My must-see is obviously the Dark Star from Top Gun. They've I got the it. static display out here. It is really neat looking, and I, I want to go out and see that. I thought, I, I thought you were going to go see it yesterday because I knew that was on your list. She's a Top Gun fan, unabashed. Oh, yeah, Top it. So there it is, the Dark Star. So at least you could see it, Jordan, if you can't make it over there. I'll just watch the footage over and over because <laughs> I think it is the coolest thing out here. The need for speed. That's, that sums up Jordan. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> There's some other really great acts out here. I really liked the Dawn Patrol that went out. I thought it was really great. One of the pilot's kids, he narrated the entire thing, and I thought that was really fun. Yeah, it was. And it's just great to see the crowd getting into, you know, air power and aviation and, and you know, just to see the kids out here. That's that's really great. And it, it's really inspiring because they, they are the next generation who will fly, fight, and win yes. for the United States Air Force. Yeah, it's been really uh, amazing to see all the crowds out here. It's already filling up. It's kind of early uh, before the show starts, and you can already see the crowds filling up and waiting on the line there. Yeah, as you get a live shot there and – it looks a little more crowded than this time yesterday. Uh, another problem for us here is there's a lot that you can actually like purchase here. There's Thunderbird swag, but there's a kettle corn stand that is literally right across the way here, and it's killing me. Oh, we can smell it. We've been sniffing it all day. <laughs> yeah. it, there's a bunch of food that you can get out here, come out, hang out, get some snacks, watch some really cool, uh, really cool shows go on. Yeah, and there's actually uh, the NASA Sophia. It does a lot of imagery and satellite work, and it's actually nearing the end of its NASA mission run. In fact, today it will be kind of its last public flight, so I think uh, they said that's going to fly around 2 o'clock, so a little bit before uh, the Thunderbirds, but that's going to be really cool as well. A lot of great static displays, not only from the Air Force, but from mission partners like NASA. And we have almost every service that's represented out here. So it's not just the Air Force. You have all the other branches out here and all the other mission partners that are out here to kind of show off what they can do. Yeah, as you get a shot there of flights over the test bed here at Edwards Air Force Base, that's what really makes this location here in the desert so unique and the ability to fly at supersonic speeds. And it's just hard to believe I was watching a video earlier today and they talked about you know them breaking the sound barrier 75 years ago but he fast forward like seven years after they broke the sound barrier then they were doing it at twice the speed of sound and then you know three times like it's just amazing what innovation in the human spirit allows you to achieve well you'll see it later when nasa does their sonic booms they did that quiet sonic boom so they'll do the demonstration of what your typical sonic boom sounds like and then they'll do that really quiet one and i think that's really neat that we've kind of modified it to where it's it's not as a big it's not as big of a boom anymore <laughs> right and we'll have megan person from the nasa armstrong center she'll be on with us and she'll talk about that it was really interesting to hear her kind of talk through the the dynamics of what that looks like and why nasa uh, is partnering with us uh, to do that kind of research and innovate accelerate and thrive uh, you know as we continue on uh, in air power for the next century but some great images there on the screen these are just 
Some of the aircraft that you will see today, again, we have a full list, a lot of civilian acts that are really cool. I mean, Rob Holland is here. He's an 11-time national champion. Vicky Benzing flies a, a World War One era aircraft. I and mean, what's really cool about her is she didn't really get her start in aviation, but she has a STEM background and then got into aerobatics. So really cool. And there you see another bomber workhorse, the B-52. So just so much on display here. And what's really cool about Edwards that you won't find at a lot of other bases is their mission is so varied and unique that all these different airframes are actually based here at Edwards. If you go to, say, uh, a hill, for example, yes, you have the F-35, but you don't have all these other aircraft. So if you live around here, you get to see some pretty cool stuff daily. Now in from the right, the B-1 continues over the battlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, even from higher altitudes, the F-16s and F-35s can employ precision laser-guided munitions on enemy targets. These aircraft have extremely powerful electrical optical sensors that can see in both infrared and visual light spectrums. These sensors enable the pilot to identify enemy tanks and equipment from ranges of greater than 10 miles. They also give the pilot the ability to scan the airfield and locate any remaining troops and equipment. As the fighter aircraft continue to circle overhead, turn your attention to your left as our special forces team approaches. These warriors are carried into battle by a C-17 from the 418th Flight Test Squadron here at Edwards. The C-17 is uniquely equipped to transport people and equipment into austere environments and its crews are specifically trained to support special operations deployments. Today, you will see paratroopers parachute out of the back of the aircraft from an altitude of 7,000 feet above the ground level and land on a drop zone even while the fight continues. The C-17 will drop members of the 412th Operations Support Squadron Test Parachute Team to take over the field. Their drop today represents a, the much larger troop insertion that would eventually take place in any airfield seizure. These troops are Air Force airmen that deploy along with their Army counterparts and can bring instant combat power and presence to the battlefield. As the friendly forces become vulnerable to enemy attack, you will continue to see the F-35s and F-16s circle overhead to provide overwatch. Let's listen in on the pilots' communications. Jester 01, Skull 01, I'm contact squirters on the airfield. It appears to be a group of soldiers carrying small arms and rockets. Skull 01 is marking the target with my laser. Jester 01, call capture my laser spot. Jester 01 is capture your spot and tally enemy troops. Stand by 9 line. 9 line Bravo, 1, 2, 3 from the wheel. 4 and 6 from your mark. Nearest friendlies, 1 minute out, preparing to jump. Weapon will be laser guided bomb. Any heading is approved. Confirm tally. You are cleared hot. Skull 01 is tally. Weapons away. 30 seconds. Lazing. The C 17 was tested at your Air Force Test Center. The C-17 was designed as a replacement to the Lockheed C-141 with some duties to supplement the C-5 mission. Its maiden flight occurred in September 1991 and it formally entered service in 1995. The final C-17 rolled off the production line just down the road in Long Beach, California in November 2015. The aircraft performs both tactical 
and strategic airlift, transporting troops and cargo throughout the world. 224 aircraft were procured by the Air Force. The aircraft is 174 feet long with a wingspan of 169 feet. The four engines can produce more than 40,000 pounds of thrust, which can also be directed backwards via reverse thrusters, allowing the large aircraft to back up and maneuver on tight airfields. Right now, overhead, cast your eyes to see your C-17 aircraft. Directly overhead, you see the shoots of our Edwards Air Force Base Paratroopers. They are Master Sergeant Austin Schmidt, <laughs> Robert Gregory, Staff Sergeant Son Kostelec Kostelecki, Staff, Staff Sergeant Marco Hernandez. They are members of the Edwards Test Parachute Program. Test infiltration parachutes, called the RA-1. The parachute is a wing that allows the jumpers to jump from 35,000 feet, 6.5 miles above the ground, and can travel over 30 miles. They can fly about 450 pounds of combat equipment to bring and are designed to be silent in flight so that you can't see or hear them as they approach at night and they do not show on radar. The jumpers you see in the sky right now jumped from 7,500 feet, about a mile and a half above the ground, and fell about 125 miles an hour through the sky. The test parachutist program has extremely experienced jumpers who have jumped anywhere from 400 to 2,400 times out of perfectly good aircraft at altitudes uh, up to 25,000 feet. A typical jump mission is completed from 13,000 feet and free fall lasts for about 46 seconds. During those 46 seconds, the jumpers work on close proximity flying and performing maneuvers that when combined with 125 mile an hour fall rate can take them over 200 miles an hour. These jumpers have two parachutes, a main and a reserve. If the main parachute has issues, they can cut it away and deploy the reserve. Or if they are injured or rendered unconscious for any reason, the reserve will activate by itself at 1,500 feet AGL. This is an inherently dangerous profession, but still safer than driving on the 5 freeway. The Air Force Test Parachutist Program is the sole development test and evaluation parachutist program in the Air Force. Additionally, these parachutists have survival, evasion, resistance, and escape capture training, making them especially valuable to the United States Air Force. They accomplish two distinct test missions, developmental test and evaluation for air crew emergency egress, as well as developmental test and evaluation for Air Force Special Tactics operators. In the first mission, they test the parachutes for rocket power ejection from high-speed aircraft and bailout, which is when, parrots, when pilots put on a parachute to jump out of a disabled aircraft. This includes the testing of gear. The aircraft uses, including recently tested, the Uniform Integrated Protective Ensemble, which protects the air crew members against chemical attacks. The Test Parachutist Program is the only program in the DOD that intentionally jumps on emergency parachutes. 
So the second mission for special tactics includes testing a variety of jump equipment like oxygen masks to let our special forces breathe in the thinner air at high altitudes, their navigation devices, and their radio equipment. They do this testing forces to infiltrate denied or contested environments in both day and night conditions. Most recently, the test parachute program tested the parachute landing assister, which utilized laser distance measuring to enable the jumpers to have safer landings anywhere in the world. The C-17 that our jumpers jump from is operated by eight allied partners throughout the globe. An M1 Abrams tank can fit inside the large belly of the aircraft. Primary missions for this aircraft include cargo and passenger movements, aeromedical evacu evacuations, personnel and cargo airdrops. To your right, the C-17 approaches for a low pass. They survey the airfield to ensure all jumpers arrive safely and have seized the field. If the jumpers needed immediate extraction due to casualties or immediate resupply, the C-17 is capable of landing on either a prepared or unprepared surface as short as 3,500 feet long. The C-17 aircraft is utilized by Air Mobility Command. Over 110,000 Air Mobility Airmen provide rapid global mobility across the world through cargo airlift and airdrop, passenger movements, aeromedical evacuations, and air-to-air -air refueling. A USAF transport aircraft departs for mission, a mission somewhere around the globe every 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Aircraft are operated by Air Mobility Command, which is headquartered at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. AMC, as it's commonly referred to, was activated June 1, 1992, but has a much longer history. AMC is the oldest major command, tracing its history to the establishment of the Air Corps Ferrying Command on 29 May 1941. Airlift allows the deployment of U.S. forces anywhere in the world within hours and helps sustain our forces in conflict. As the C-17 passes show center, notice the ramp and door are down in the back. Our loadmasters and other crew members are waving to you at the back. Please feel free to wave to them. They can see you.
Ladies and gentlemen, our demonstration is almost concluded, but please stick around as our paratroopers have returned to the ramp. Now, cast your eyes left for our F-16 aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, setting up from the east for landing is your Edwards Air Force Cameron Kidnap Jones, a veteran of the skies over Syria and Iraq. He is a test pilot at the 411th Flight Test Squadron. The crew chiefs are Charles Shearer from California City, part of the 411th Aircraft Maintenance Unit with five years of civil service, and Airman First Class Austin Davis from Drexel, Missouri, also from the 411th Aircraft Maintenance Unit with two years of active duty service. F-35. The pilot is Major Matt Flint Stein, a veteran of the skies over Afghanistan, Southeast Asia, and Syria. Flint is a test pilot in the 461st Flight Test Squadron. Behind the F-35s is the F-16 flight lead, Major Tommy Lethal Cunningham, a veteran of the skies over Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq. And his wingman is Major Bryce Triple Turner, a veteran of the skies over the crew chiefs are Staff Sergeant Andrew Pennington from Bridge City, Louisiana, part of the 412th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron and serving eight years of active duty. And Senior Aircraft Maintenance Squadron with three years on active duty. As our fighters come in for landing, please join me in thanking the personnel involved in the demonstration today. Let's let them hear your applause. Now move your attention to the east as the B-1 is Lieutenant Colonel Scott Epic Ponzer, Major Gregory Evil Marcus, John Howley Shimsky, and Glenn Doc Watson. They are veterans of Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq, and members of the 419 Flight Tef Squadron. The crew chiefs are Edward Landevere from Van Nuys, California, part of the 912 Aircraft Maintenance Squadron with 16 years of Army service and two years of Air Force Civil Service. And Mark Dupuy from Redessa, California, also part of the 912 Aircraft Maintenance Squadron, who retired after two years of active duty and four years of service. The KC-135 is following the B-1 Lancer. The crew of the 135 is made for a court and Major Tim Ultra Schick. Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Gennachi. They are veterans of Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, UAE, and Africa. They are all members of the 418th Flight Test Squadron. And if you direct your eyes slightly higher, you can see the C-17 coming in for a combat approach. The final members of the demonstration of this approach, Team R, Major J. Toast Curl, Major Rachel Tumble Williams, Captain Richard Gagloff, and Two Change Dishane, Staff Sergeant Andrew Hathaway, Staff Sergeant Samantha Mariato, and Master Sergeant Scott Schick Reddy. They are veterans of Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Qatar, Oman, UAE, and Kuwait. And they are all members of the 418 Flight Test Squadron. Thank you, 
You know, folks, it takes an entire team to bring our mission to the battlefield. Let me introduce to you some of the folks who, do, who are contributors to this and our mission support group led by Colonel Jared Blecker and Chief Master Sergeant Swissstack, outstanding members of our team who provide the base housing, child care facilities, our gymnasium, personnel support throughout the mission support group here at your Edwards Air Force Base. Thank you to all of them. Additionally, our medical team has a fantastic day today and outstanding. Not only do our medical professionals keep the military team up and running every day, they keep many of you up and running as well, especially some of you who have forgotten to put on sunscreen. And right now, I'd like to introduce Francis. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Colonel Isaac Francis once again, 412th Med Group. I want to give a huge shout out to the men and women of the 412th Med Group. Day three of this air show. I could not have done it without you. Um, this mission could not have been uh, successful without you, and I want to give you my huge heartfelt congratulations and appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Master Sergeant Swiss Stack from the 412 Mission Support Group. I uh, just wanted to give a huge shout out to the Mission Support Group. We got defenders out here all over the ramp, keeping you safe and make sure this is an excellent show for everybody. We got FSS throughout, right? This did not happen without FSS. We got LRS making sure all logistics happen. And of course we got COM making sure your cell phones work out here. Big shout out, MSG, you rock. From Colonel A.V. Brown, myself, Colonel Missile Mazel, the pilots, the aircraft maintenance teams, and everyone else involved in our demonstration. We enjoyed bringing you this show, and thank you for your attendance in today's event. This was just a small display of the incredible capability that your armed forces have available to defend this country and its interests. Wherever, whenever we are called, know that we are ready to fight, and it is our honor to defend this nation. Thank you.
science, technology, engineering, and math. Vicki is sponsored by California Aeronautical University, an aeronautical training center offering aviation-related degree programs to prepare students for exciting careers in Airport. The on airport campus hosts ideal flying conditions year round. Student housing at FAA Part 141 of Route Training. You can visit California Aeronautical University on EDU, or better yet, you can visit them here today. They're set up and waiting for you. Tulsa, Oklahoma, back in 1940 by the Boeing Aircraft Company for use as a military trainer. It served during World War II at air bases in Mississippi, in Georgia, and Alabama, where hundreds of pilots learned to fly. In 1946, after the war ended, the airplane was transferred to Eagle Field, Palos, California. disassembled and put in storage. 1990, that changed around, and Vicky ended up with it in 1998. Faces it now at a Pine Mountain Lake Airport near Yosemite, California, where she cares for it to keep it flying into these wonderful aerobatic sports. shows, hence it takes two hands on the stick and a lot of muscle for Vicky to roll it, and roll it very slowly. With only two ailerons, the top wing wants to go straight while the bottom wing wants to roll. So Vicky Stearman also does not have an inverted fuel system. So upside down too long. So she's got to keep positive G on it. At all times, Vicky considers herself lucky to be a steward of this timeless piece of history, her beautiful red steer. especially for World War II and then a little beyond. And of course, serving California as a crop patrol with their... Live look at the crowd here. Day two of this 2022 Aerospace Valley Air Show, live from Edwards Air Force Base. And, sir, you just got off the podium, the airfield, the combat seizure demonstration. This is Colonel Ahave Brown. He goes by AB. He's the commander of the 412th Maintenance Group here at Edwards. And... Sir, how's the air show been for you and your team so far? Well, I, I tell you what, Dan, it is just, has been amazing. This is an outstanding opportunity uh, for all young people to come out and realize that they can be a part of this dream. We have aircraft and maintainers. We have defenders and combat medics all exercising their expertise to make it all happen. 
Yeah, and so tell me a little bit about the 412th Maintenance Group. I know you lead uh, almost 1,800 people in development and test for 53 aircraft across nine different series. I mean, sounds like a lot of technical terms, but layman's terms, what do you guys do? Well, in layman's terms, if you really want to look at it, uh, we take designs. We build all of the equipment from those designs for various different Department of Defense needs and aircraft. We put them on the actual aircraft, and then we get them ready for flight. Most of the aircraft we have here are one of a kind, and that's what makes it so unique. If you look at the history of Edwards and all of the things that we have done here, the SR-71, the F-117, a stealth fighter, we still continue along that line. But there are so many other things about Edwards that we contribute to from the maintenance group standpoint, whereas there are different weapon systems that we will test. There are different partnerships that we will work with Lockheed Martin, as well as Boeing Aerospace and many others, so that we can get these things tested and ready for our Department of Defense missions. Yeah, and it's really unique because, you know, yesterday we had Brigadier General Higer on, and, you know, his vision is, is this isn't really so much of an air show, it's a STEM air show or a STEM expo, if you will. And can you talk about the role that science, technology, engineering, math, how that plays into what you guys do every day and you guys do every what you guys are trying to do to inspire the next generation of STEM engineers and pilots and, and the people who do the mission here at Edwards? Oh, absolutely. That is a fantastic question because that is what this expo is all about. Letting the 3 to 13 year old know that the math classes that she or he are taking right now are just a stepping stone to take them to the dreams and the aspirations that they desire. What we're looking at here from a scientific standpoint, we have to understand how all of the architecture of the aircraft fits together. One of the unique aspects of an airplane that many people don't think about is every system on the airplane is almost wired together because it all has to be grounded to the airplane. There's no long wire stretching from the ground as the airplane flies. So when we look at the calculations of how much wiring we want to take off the airplane, we also have to balance that with how much we're putting back on. All of this comes into the engineering aspect of it. And there's a heavy dose of mathematics. And even from a standpoint of understanding uh, how much wiring we can put on an aircraft, some of these designs are put together by engineers and really tried for the very first time here at Edwards. So this STEM Expo is really showcasing all of these items. And in Hangar 1600, we have several setups where the young kids and even some old kids can see exactly how we put this together on B-52 and F-16 aircraft firsthand. Yeah, it's really cool. And I'm just, you know, General Brown, our Air Force Chief of Staff, talks about not accepting the status quo and innovation clearly fits into that. Can you talk about the role innovation plays in what not only your maintenance group does, but across Edwards in the test and development world? Absolutely. When we sit back and look at innovation and understanding what General Brown has tasked us to do, we will accelerate. We will continue to meet our challenges head on, and we want to ensure that not only do Americans feel safe underneath the banner of our flag, but our adversaries know that at a moment's notice we can be anywhere in the world and ready to bring forth some of the firepower that you saw distributed today. We also fully understand that from an innovation standpoint, we can't stay stagnant. We must continue to find new ways of doing things. Many of these airplanes that we see on the ramp today were once new. And there's better and greater technology coming forward. And many of the young people out here today are dreaming of ways to make it better. And we want to provide an Air Force as well as a country where they can dare to dream big, dare to dream large, and know that their Air Force is going to have not only air power, but a country where they can do it free from harm. Yeah, and I think it's important to note you brought up a really great point about strategic competition. Our adversaries, our number one pacing threat being China. Uh, We know that they have their foot on the gas pedal when it comes to modernization and innovation. We have to do the same things, right? Well, absolutely. I have had the pleasure of being a part of the United States Air Force for 36 years. And I can tell you from the day I walked in the door of June 1986 to today, we have not taken our foot off the accelerator. We don't shirk for a minute, and we fully understand with our partners from the Navy, the United States Marine Corps, as well as our folks in the Space Force and the Army, that we are 
the front runners. We will continue to be the front runners. The United States of America and its allies are ready. We will not shirk from any challenge that comes before us. And I think you make an excellent point as well. We haven't talked about it yet this weekend, but, you know, with the recent release of the Purple Book, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joanne Bass, just recently made a big announcement with that book's release. But everything that you guys do at Edwards is, in essence, tied to that integration, but not necessarily always international, but definitely inner service and inner agency to make this all work together in a partnership that's beneficial for everybody. Absolutely. If we look out on the ramp today, we will see aircraft from Australia. We will see some of our teammates from the UK. And we will see individuals from our private partners, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, and the like. This is a team endeavor. It's going to take us all, uh, again, all services to include our Coast Guard comrades. It's going to take us all to get this done and get it done right and consistently. Yeah, it, as you look at a I think is that a T6 up there? I can't tell. Yes. I'm looking at the screen there. <laughs> but either way like I, I wanted to ask, you're around this mission every day, and we talked about it in, in the show before the actual uh, ceremony started, but this base is so unique because it's not like, you know, a Hill Air Force base where they have the F-35. You guys have a, a million different aircraft out here. Does it get old? Does, do you get a little jaded when you see all, I mean, the B-1 flying by? Not everybody gets to see that every day. Well, I will tell you, uh, it never gets old for me. Uh, when we sit back and look at Edwards Air Force Base, we're uniquely positioned where our Department of Defense needs us. We have an outstanding bit of real estate, a phenomenal lake bed where we can do all kinds of missions and testing. Additionally, we have unlimited sky from the ground up where we can fly and execute these missions. We also have leadership that keeps us prepared and ready to go. General Dertine and General Heiger both understand the mission needs, and they have set us up for success. We're ready to go. There's no stopping. Yeah, that, I think people don't realize, I mean, not only is it about the aircraft, but we also have the test pilot school here. I mean, there's so many different interesting aspects, but kind of like the wiring in the aircraft that you talked about, it's all kind of interrelated and tied together, and that's what really makes this mission here so unique, I think. Absolutely. We can send our folks to various different places across the globe to augment different test and evaluation missions. Uh, I have uh, individuals just from my maintenance group in 14 other, 15 other, excuse me, different locations right now who are executing the mission for the United States Air Force. Uh, again, this is far-reaching. We fully understand here at Edwards Air Force Base that this is the center of the aerospace testing universe. Nobody does tests like we do. There are many other places where tests are accomplished, but we're uniquely situated to execute a mission here. And our leadership has us prepared to go. And as a member of that team, I want to assure all of those young folks out there that one, we're preparing an Air Force that is continually ready. Every day is game day. And we will do everything in our power to make sure that when you come to Edwards Air Force Base or anywhere else in the Department of Defense, you know that the Air Force is ready. Along with all of our DOD partners and mission industry partners, we're ready to execute. We're ready to accelerate. Talk a little bit about the people aspect of, of the Air Force. Obviously, the total force family, the big A airmen family, but there, there's taking care of airmen and families, a huge priority, of course, for our Air Force leadership, all the way down to, uh, obviously, at, at your level and even below. But can you talk about the opportunities that exist uh, for employment out here at Edwards? There's all kinds of jobs across the spectrum here. Absolutely. Uh, Edwards Air Force Base has jobs. Maybe you're not interested in aircraft per se. But maybe you may be interested in construction. We have openings in those areas. Engineering may be the taste for some, and we have openings there. Maybe you desire to have a career in healthcare. We have outstanding medics led by Colonel Isaac Francis. We have individuals out here on the flight line who fully understand the airfield and what it takes to ensure that this airfield is prepared. There are multiple things that can be done with our vehicle maintenance. So maybe if you are in a vehicle aficionado, we have a place for you. Man, woman, boy or girl, it doesn't matter your nationality. We have a place for you. We want you to be the best airman that you can be. We want to let you know that this is an environment 
where everyone is treated with equality and also given an opportunity to excel and realize their dreams. We also realize that there is a level of compliance that must go with all of these things so that we all stay in alignment with one another, as well as the goals that have been put forward by the Secretary of the Air Force. Yeah, so I'm curious, you know, being around all these wide variety of aircraft, I, I'm sure you've had a chance to walk around. I mean, what was the one or two things where you were like, you know, I really need to see that while the air show is happening this weekend. I'm curious. Outstanding. Well, you know, I have been around a number of aircraft, but I always love seeing the SR-71. That is a phenomenal aircraft. Uh, just in the fibers of American history as well as folklore. But I will also tell you that uh, the 135 has a special place in my heart. The 135 that flew in our air demonstration was an aircraft that I had a chance to work on when I was a two-striper in the Air Force. So to see it flying today is an outstanding tribute to an aircraft that was built in 1962 and is still flying for sure that our Air Force is ready anytime, any place to go and execute the nation's missions. And I, I think that's a great segue to how great a job our maintainers do to keep an aircraft that I won't date you, but however many years <laughs> yes, ago, sir. but that it's still flying operational today and doing great things for our Air Force. I mean, that's really a testament to our maintainers. Oh, absolutely. I am an aircraft maintainer through and through that every day is game day. The professionalism exhibited by our maintainers is an absolute must. An understanding of the science and the technology and the engineering of that aircraft is etched into the fiber of each and every maintainer, from our weapons loader to our crew chief, to environmental specialists to our ComNav specialists. They must all understand how we all operate to make sure that we are safe and ready to go. I will tell you, our technicians are our most lethal weapon system. The Great. The toys are awesome, but it still takes girls and boys. And I'm here to tell you, we have the most outstanding folks that you can imagine. Just think about it. These moms and dads didn't give us their car. They didn't give us their bank account. They gave us their most prized possession, their sons and daughters. And it's our obligation to train them, equip them, and prepare them to execute the test and evaluation missions that occur here at the center of the testing universe for stopping by i mean what the 412th maintenance group as well as the entire team at edwards here does to deliver agile war winning capabilities for both air force materiel command and air force it's really inspiring so thank you very much much and uh, each and every member and for all those who are contemplating whether they want to come on board please know we have a place for you we welcome your ingenuity your intelligence and your brilliance bring it on so that you can be the best that you can be aim high airmen there you go. You heard it. A.B. Brown, they're hiring. So check out your local Air Force recruiter. Let's throw it back out to the Air Boss as day two of this Aerospace Valley Air Show continues. And a warm welcome today, too, from the L.A. County Supervisor, Catherine Barker. Cerro Coastal Community College are here as well to talk to you about, you about education locally, college courses, financial aid, admissions assistance. And they are in a hangar. 1600 behind us as well, Cerro Coso Community College. General Adam and Atomics, they're hiring. So if you love aviation and technology, they want to talk to you about being a world leader in unmanned aircraft systems. General Atomics and another sponsor, you must thank Edwards Federal Credit Union, offering all Antelope Valley residents better loan rates, higher savings rates through branches on base in Palmdale and online at edwardsfcu.org.
taking off right now to continue our history is the T-33 jet you see in front of you taking off. It came from the P-80. We're going to tell you that story, the story of the Air Force's first operational jet fighter. Now it was built in secrecy here. All those years ago, the story of Lockheed Skunk Works coming up as Greg quickly shakes the T-33 out to make sure it's working in perfect flying condition before he commits to this spectacular routine. And you see how still impressive this jet is all these years later. opportunities coming over your right shoulder right now. We begin with the T-33 photo pass. Tactical Service Command met with Lockheed Aircraft Corporation to express its dire need for a jet fighter to counter a rapidly growing German jet threat. One month later, a young engineer by the name of Clarence Kelly L. Johnson and his team of young engineers hand-delivered the XB-80 Shooting Star. The jet fighter proposal, it was underway, and quickly the go-ahead was given for Lockheed to start development on the United States' first jet fighter effort. June 1943, this project marked the birth of what would become the Skunk Works with Kelly Johnson at its helm. within the Skunk Works. Many times, a customer would come to the Skunk Works with a request, and on a handshake, the project would begin. No contracts in place, no official submittal process. T-33 
63 that you're seeing today was developed from Lockheed's P-80, F-80, starting as the TP-80C, then the TF-80C in development, and then designated the T-33A, first flying in 1948. And a great example flying for us here today with Greg Collier at the controls, the T-33. still so impressive today. So how did the Skunk Works get its name? When we continue. Wartime 1943, as I mentioned, when Kelly Johnson brought together a hand picked team of young Lockheed Aircraft Corporation engineers and manufacturing people to rapidly and secretly complete the XP 80 project. Because the war effort was in full swing, there was no space available at the Lockheed facility for Johnson's effort. Consequently, Johnson's organization operated out of a rented circus tent next to a manufacturing plant that produced a strong odor which permeated the tent. Each member of Johnson's team was cautioned that design and production of the new SP-80 Greg Collier in the T-33 Ace Maker delighting this crowd. Day two of this 2022 Aerospace Valley Air Show. Dan Hawkins alongside Halita Van Hoy. She is the STEM coordinator here at Edwards Air Force Base. The freshly minted with an Air Force medal for all of her work here for the Edwards Air Show and, and the STEM component specifically. Halita, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to see how many people are out here. I'm very happy that we were able to have over 64 STEM hands-on activities for the students. It's really cute that the kids are telling me, oh, I've decided I'm going to be a pilot. I'm like, woohoo! And then I give them information about the over 365 scholarship opportunities for pilots. And I've had a few kids tell me that they want to be engineers, so then I give them information about the scholarships for engineering. So it's really great. Yeah, so talk about that a little bit. We didn't really, you came by yesterday, we didn't really talk about the scholarships very much, but what kind of scholarships are out there uh, for our future pilots? There are so many scholarships. So I'm a member of the 99s, which is an organization for female pilots. And we have lots of scholarships for females who are interested in flying. There are also lots of scholarships with uh, women in aviation, which is not just for women. Um, it originally started to help women that are interested in all types of flying careers, whether it's engineering, mathematicians, uh, all different types of engineering, as well as uh, maintenance on aircraft and piloting. So uh, the women's, um, Women in Aviation has over 360 scholarships for both males and females to be able to go into any of those fields. Wow, that sounds really cool. You see some shots there in the box from the STEM Expo. You mentioned it, over 64 displays. And how's the crowds been all weekend in, in the hangar? It is so exciting to see. You see so many kids with very happy faces. Parents are happy to see the, that the kids are enjoying themselves. We have very positive feedback from the teachers telling us how exciting it is to be able to share this information with the kids because there's nothing like seeing it firsthand versus just hearing about it in the class or watching a video about it when they're actually here and they're truly talking to our NASA team from NASA Armstrong right here on base as well as our own squadrons um, that are sharing what their careers are like here at Edwards Air Force Base. Yeah, and it's really interesting to me, like, you know, I, I can remember being a kid and my dad was in the Navy and the first air show I ever went to was actually at Naval Air Station Corpus Christi, Texas, seeing the Blue Angels, not the Thunder. Birds, but, but, uh, 
the experience that these kids are actually having this weekend at Edwards Air Force Base really could shape their future, and that's why we do this. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Inspiring our youth, helping them. You know, you have to go beyond inspiring because it's one thing for them to see it and get excited about it, but then they need to know what happens next. And their experience, their education, and what type of scholarships are available out there for these types of careers. Yeah, and so what, what were maybe the top two or three... simulators so we have sim uh, VR simulators where if you're flying and you look back you can literally see the tail of the aircraft it's really cool so our simulators are a huge hit today is so much different than in our generation and and I think about how the air education and training command is transforming pilot training undergrad use of AI instruction uh, where, you know, students before they actually fly a sortie can actually fly it in the simulator, you know, multiple times. And before and it's maybe not as difficult so talk, talk about the impact that VR and AR has had and how you guys do business here from a STEM perspective. It's That's all. Anything that is in that realm, that they really enjoy and they really get into it. And then that takes them to the next step. So after that, we also have a... a the, on the uh, playing, uh, where the kids have recess or whatever area they want or wherever they wanted us to set it up. And that comes along with four or five pilots, uh, glider pilots that come out with us. and. are used to maneuver the aircraft so the kids start to learn about roll pitch and yaw and they get really excited and the culminating event with that is we take them out to Skylark North and to Hatchapi um, and we offer some glider rides for yeah and so that so so many unique things and but you talked about it like it's cool to maybe see it but to experience it that's really what this is about right the that's experience. exactly what it's about like I mentioned before General Hager's Amazing. So we had over 15,000 students register for these events, but because a lot of people were struggling with getting buses because everybody wanted to be here, um, that number came down. So in order to be able to have them experience the first hand on Wednesday, we had a flyover around some of the local schools that had registered and that unfortunately were not able to participate due to busing restrictions. So there's nothing like feeling that aircraft, hearing the aircraft, you know, and being able to experience it firsthand. Yeah, I was walking through the crowd, and when the F-22s and, and uh, such were flying right at the very start of the air show, and just people were just stopping in their tracks, like people running into each other because they're like they're looking skyward, and that's so really so cool to see, especially for the community. And I know you guys do tons in the community. Not just it's not just a oh we did this this year and now it'll be another two years before we do STEM activities. Can you just talk about uh, your outreach efforts uh, on behalf of the base uh, out in the communities that surround absolutely we support over 40 events a year stem events whether it's math leads robotics science fairs all sorts of events and depending on the type of event we bring engineers that specialize in whatever it is that the event is about and the kids really enjoy it we try to share whatever we can to inspire motivate and engage these students that are really excited about stem all right. and, and a lot of times you motivate the kids that you least expect that like it might have been something that they never thought of but now it's like that's it that's exactly what I want to do so you just never know you just have to do your very best to help our local K through 12 students and do the best you can all right so I see General Heiger is over on stage left over there stage right but tell us uh, about the hangar, when are you guys closing up today? Uh, when can people get over there till and, and experience this? People can continue to go over there until the end of the air show. So once the Thunderbirds are done flying, we start um, asking people to go ahead and head out. 
And uh, at that point, it'll be the end of three amazing days, a lot of very motivated and excited students. It was very exciting to, sh to see and experience. So I thank General Hyger for the opportunity. Well, on behalf of our entire team, congratulations on your award. So well-deserved. Really appreciate all your efforts. We're going to kick it back out to the air boss, but we're going to come back here in just a few minutes. The aforementioned Brigadier General Matt Heiger, the commander of the 412 12th Swing, will be our guest as the 2022 Aerospace Valley Air Show continues live here at Edwards Air Force Base. on board. Monica, he said, did really well, and she's interested now in continuing to fly with him and, uh, and get her proficiency up with her license and, uh, and take on some aerobatics. So we may have a new, not only actress, but aerobatic and airshow performer in the works. He's going to climb and he's going to start his routine by falling, not flying. Now he's completely disconnected. Uh, the air shield, well, the airplane might as well be a manhole cover at this point. Round and round he's going, but he's not flying. The wings aren't helping a bit. He's just falling. He's got to get the nose down. He's got to get the wings connected again with the right angle of attack and right at bow. The same distance from the ground, and that's pretty dramatic for an opening. Chuck Coleman in his extra 300. Chuck is an aerospace mechanical degree from the University of Michigan. He's an FAA licensed airplane power plant. He just loves flying test missions. And he's done an awful lot of that with deposits and others in the industry as he launches now high above us and squaring things off. I gotta bring Victoria in at this point because I think it's a good tie-in with a man who knows a thing or two about test flying and not on the level of Victoria's husband. Back here at the Aerospace Valley Air Show, day two, and now delighted to be joined once again by the commander of the four I can't say it anymore, 412th Test Wing, Brigadier General Matt Heiger, a combat veteran of Operation Southern Watch, can fly 40 different aircraft, or at least spent some time in those 40 aircraft for sure. Uh, sir... The air show has been a lot of fun, and we had a great crowd yesterday. We did. Uh, so first day open to the public in 13 years yesterday. Uh, we didn't take an exact census, uh, but estimates are based on the number of cars we had and some number of people on, somewhere between 38 and 42,000 folks through the gates uh, yesterday, uh, clearly exceeding our minimum expectations and, and a little bit shy of our maximum, which is about the sweet spot. Uh, super thankful that uh, everybody was able to flow in quick. Parking went well, buses went well, the logistics are going great. Uh, if you did not make it yesterday and you were not here right now, folks, you are really missing out. And, and I want to, uh, in my opening remarks today, I said thanks. I'll say thanks again. A core team of a very small group, you know, dozen-ish, made this whole thing happen. For execution, we're, we're right around 1,000 people supporting this group of two days now of tens of thousands. That's an example of the low density, high demand that uh, airmen do, airmen all ranks and uh, all flavors, if you will, active duty, reserve, and civilians. Yeah, so definitely a total team effort. In fact, we had Miss Van Hoy on just a few minutes ago, and you know she did and her team uh, such a great job. And, and you said it yesterday, so I kind of wanted to give you a chance to re-echo that, but this isn't an air show. 
It's a STEM expo with some planes flying. It is. It really is. It's, uh, I, I told the team very early in our planning and our discussions that we need to stop talking about this as just an air show or the air show because an air show is an important part of this, and a lot of people are going to bring here and bring their families with them because of what's going on behind us right now. And, and, and uh, by the way, I'm all good with that. But what we're really here for is to get people exposed to a military base and to see things that are parked on the ramp, not just flying above it. And then unique in Air Force history, the, the Air Force's largest science, technology, engineering, and math expo is happening in uh, the iconic Hangar 1600. Uh, it's a hangar big enough to hold literally a B-52 right now, and it doesn't even seem to dent the space. And there are thousands of kids going through there, kids of all ages, but we targeted the ages 3 to 13. On Friday, we had uh, just over 8,000 students from the local area, and we're estimating that of the crowd of 40,000 yesterday, about a quarter were under the age of 18. So that's a huge impact and a huge exposure. And if they think it flying airplanes are cool, fine. But what we really need them to do as a nation is go, tech is cool. I want to stay in that tough class. I want to do something with industry. Maybe I want to do the military. Maybe I don't, but I want to I be involved in something that is greater than myself, bigger than myself, and you don't have to be in the military to do that. But uh, the demonstrations that are happening behind us and will be happening the rest of the day are testament to all the folks in all the career fields that have made that happen for many, many decades. So the theme of this year's air show is breaking tomorrow's barriers today. And harkens back, a nod back to the history here at Edwards Air Force Base. General Chuck Yeager and the Bell X-1 team breaking the sound barrier. And to that, with Secretary Kendall here and, and General Brown uh, on Friday, you made a big announcement. Let's take a look. In honor and in memory of the team, the team of Big A Airmen, whose collective individual contributions coalesced into something much more powerful than they could have ever imagined. Indeed, more powerful than the coalesced air pressure on the front edge of an airplane that creates the pressure differential that your ears hear as a boo. In their honor and their memory, effective with the next booms you hear, we officially christen that high altitude supersonic corridor, the Bell X-1 supersonic corridor in their memory and in their honor. What a moment on Friday and so richly deserved by really the pioneers of supersonic flight. It is. Pioneers of test, pioneers of the Air Force. You know, if you... I, 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 look, I was very honored to be a part of the team that uh, that officially got to rechristen that, but I, I was not the originator of the idea, and I certainly wasn't the one that uh, ran all the paperwork to rename the corridor, the Bell X-1 Supersonic Corridor, which runs a couple hundred miles across the Mojave Desert. It goes uh, well east of Barstow and almost to Bakersfield, 30,000 feet and above, literally over where we are seated right now. All of the booms that we've heard during the air show, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and most of the booms that we hear routinely here in the Aerospace Valley happened in that corridor. And so now on the radio, every time someone asks for permission to fly in the corridor or Joshua Approach, who controls it, gives them approval to fly in that corridor, they're going to say Bell X-1. And that, that continuing legacy and that continuing memory and honor is why we did it. Uh, but it, the, the point of it being the Bell X-1 and not any individual name is that it took a team. Test is a team sport. The Air Force is a team sport. Life is a team sport. Uh, and there's a lot of people that made that happen, and, and it's in their collective honor that we do that and did that. Um, and I, I watched the replay of the video there, and on stage I had the same, uh, I'll say emotion, right? Uh, it's the tingling, for me, it's a tingling down the back of my neck, you know, hair standing on edge. That's the same feeling I get when I see our colors flying and I hear our national anthem, like I did this morning and yesterday morning when Wings of Blue jumped in that gorgeous uh, Star Spangled Banner, uh, that, that, that glorious, glorious flag there, uh, carried in by a senior at the United States Air Force Academy. Uh, she and I got to talk Friday night, and she is just super thrilled that this was the place she got to do her first jump of the American flag. And I'm like, well, Edwards is a place of first. Welcome to the team. And for everybody that I meet here that's, hey, it's my first time at Edwards or my first time on a military base, I remind them, this is a place of first. Welcome to the team. And, and the last thing on the team part and the barriers part, you know, we looked at the sound barrier as a, you can't get there, you can't break that. And in fact, we did, and now it just becomes a milestone in history. But those are not all the barriers. They're not all physics-based. They're not all science-based. There are other barriers that our nation and our Air Force has broken 
And I think our nation is led by the Department of Defense and the department is led by our service in breaking a whole bunch of other barriers. And I talked about that a lot in my remarks on Friday as well. But the team that is going to take us to the next one into the future is going to be an extremely diverse team with very broad background. And that is an asymmetric advantage that China and Russia will never be able to compete. It's the big A in airmen, and that's a true big A tent. And I'm excited about that. And diversity, not just in our rated officer ranks who actually fly the aircraft, but I think across the board, and I think all Air Force leadership would agree with that, it's so important because it brings the perspectives that we need to defeat our adversaries in today's era of strategic it, competition. It, it absolutely is. You know, uh, Dan, like you said yesterday, you and I could talk on a lot of topics very important and very passionate that I'm very passionate about. Um, a lot of people hear the diversity word and, and they immediately jump on the de ethnic or demographic diversity. Super important, super valuable, and we have room to grow there as a service and a nation. But, the, but that's just one component of diversity. Diversity could be life experience or diversity in rank. I mean, you had a phenomenal senior officer uh, on this broadcast not too long ago that was prior enlisted. He's my only prior enlisted uh, senior leader on this installation. And so that is diversity that Colonel A.B. Brown brings to our team because he's worn both, if you will, both types of uniform. He also, in a crowd around the table, brings a maintenance perspective. And so his career progression as an officer also brings diversity through experience. And that has nothing to do with his, his ethnic or demographic diversity. And so that broader perspective is how the team makes better decisions. And, and it's, we've proved it again and again and again that broad teams with the that believe their inputs are going to be listened to so that they're willing to bring them up kicks the backside of any other team that's not diverse or doesn't get those opinions in every single time. And we do that very well in our Air Force, very, very well. And I we, we beat the world in that too. And speaking of that, always opportunities here at Edwards for – anybody really who has the passion and desire to serve to come out and work with this great team absolutely uh so and it isn't the 412 test wing at edwards yes we're the installation host yes we are a test wing and we have a mission wing but edwards edwards has a whole bunch of mission partners here and if you don't if you're not interested in working for the department of defense that's no problem there are a bunch of contractors here that serve with the 412 test wing and others but also work with non-department of defense folks nasa has a huge presence here uh, there are defense contractors and partners down at Plant 42. And, and there are a lot of people that uh, relish this kind of environment. And boy, look at the blue sky behind me. It is gorgeous here today, folks. Low 80, sun out, no wind. Oops, I said the four-letter W word. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is a great place to live with a very tight community. And if you like that environment, uh, there are just so many options for you to do both in and out of uniform, both in government service and out of government service. And folks that have worked in the broader aerospace valley for 20, 30, 40 or more years – uh, they will have moved through a career progression that takes them in and out of industry or in between different government organizations. And my technical director started life as an Northrop Grumman employee and transitioned from Northrop Grumman, so industry, to the Air Force uh, and has did some really, really early things in electronic warfare. And then he was instrumental in getting the F-35 to its initial uh, operational capability. And he's now working with to get a whole bunch of the future barriers broken on things like B-21, upgrades to KC-46. Uh, what are we going to do for modernization of the F-35? And there's more and more and more. So yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity, a great example, and not just for active duty folks. And you speak about the B-21, that that first aircraft expected to roll out here later this year. That's going to be some exciting times. I mean, it's not just one thing. I mean, it, the first just keep coming. They do. And, and so one of the items that was really important to me is to put together this, this air show, this open house, this STEM event uh, on the year that the Air Force turned 75 and 75 years to the day Friday of us breaking the sound barrier is that it not be a historical look back. Now, there's a lot of proud heritage that we have here, but taking what those teams and those individuals did and, and, and pulling forward the secret sauce of innovation, of not accepting that there's a barrier and going into the unexplored, that is what's going to propel us forward. So my challenge to the team was let's look forward and figure out what barriers we're going to break next and then the one after that and after that and after that, leaning on what we've done in the past but not being – uh, constrained or shackled by it. It's uh, truly an amazing, amazing team and an amazing environment. The, the energy is palpable on this installation almost every day. 
uh, and it is certainly palpable on this flight line today, and it will be for those big milestone events in the not-too-distant future, as it always has been. Well, sir, we want to thank you for stopping by the team, obviously, uh, the theme of the weekend, but clearly breaking the barriers of tomorrow, getting it done today. So thank you to you and the entire team for what you do. Uh, Dan, I take very, very little credit for what this team does. I'm proud to support them and proud to just be their number one cheerleader and fan. Uh, no joke, the air show team, very small group of folks. Sam Freeland, I'll call out Major Freeland, and I'll call out Miss Becca Schweitzer. The, they're the two leads, and uh, Nerf uh, Neely, he's the air boss. Those three and a, and a small core group around them are the real heroes that made this all happen over the last five years of planning. And they had a, a, a great group that fell in around them, and there's a whole bunch of folks here that have been in execution mode the last three days. And I'll pass on the credit to them because they're the ones that so aptly deserve it. So that was Brigadier General Matt Heiger thanking everybody for coming out this weekend as this 2022 Aerospace Valley Air Show continues. Don't forget the Thunderbirds are coming up at about 2.30 Pacific Standard Time. So we hope that you'll stay on with us for the broadcast. And Megan, per excuse me, person from the NASA uh, Armstrong Flight Center is coming up next as well. So let's kick it back out to the Air Boss. And you hear the jet engine now assist him in staying right here in the box, dialing things up a little bit, increasing the speed, and increasing his uh, oh, layer of difficulty with his aerobatics, with this big, beautiful wing, that airplane, he has to fly out ahead of it. Because those wings, they don't want to turn. They don't want, they just want to stay straight. And lift. So now he's out of the power of his jet engine with 250 horsepower and a 40 pound tiny jet engine. And now he's going to dial it up just a little bit and have some fun for us. Mark Carlton. Up to 175 miles per hour of fun. Bob is from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he lives with his wife, Lori, and their two dogs, Ginger and Dewey. He's 61, flying for over 40 years, and he's won every award they're given to win in the Air Show Super Salto. They've been making military grade hardware for decades, including the APUs on many Russian jet fighters. In fact, that's what this TJ100 would be used for. 240 pounds of thrust, weighs 40 pounds, and it's just perfect for what Bob likes to do. Like a little Bob. You can see how hard it is for him to turn that fighter right now. That big wing and all that speed. So once again, again, get it where he wants it to go. He's got to be well ahead in flight. A retired rocket scientist, that's what he is, and this is what happens with rocket scientists over a couple of brewskis and say a fire out in the desert. Next thing you know, he's putting a jet engine on a glider and he's solved his tow plane problems and he's come up with an award-winning air show act. And to top this, he's actually designing a, yet another sailplane with not one, but two jet engines on it. What's that? flying up to 13,000 feet in a hot air balloon, hang gliding for over 100 miles, and flying a sailplane over 200 miles, and just loves the ridge waves, New Mexico, and other places across America too, and performing at air shows in his jet-powered Super Salto sailplane. <laughs> And now when he dedicates to those flying, the predator, the drones, 
The Bob Carlton Jet Glider wowing the crowd here on this final day of the 2022 Aerospace Valley Air Show. Dan Hawkins, joined now by Megan Person from the Armstrong Flight Center, NASA in the house. How's NASA it going? in the house. We're happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so uh, what have you been up to over these two days? I'm sure with all the NASA assets here at the Air Show, you've been busy. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a couple of static displays on the ground, and we've had Sophia here for a couple of days, and uh, uh, she's getting ready. I think she's pulling back now, getting ready to taxi out here in a little bit. And then, you know, we've got the STEM Expo going on, so we're keeping our staff super busy, having a good time. Yeah, and uh, coming up, we'll have the demonstration with the sonic booms, and we talked a little bit about that yesterday and the research that that your team is doing in partnership with others uh, on how to create a quieter, a thud, I think you called it, or a thump. Yeah, a thump, our sonic thump. And, you know, it's interesting, if anybody was watching yesterday, we heard three. And so I have an explanation on what happened because all of us were like, what what was that? Uh, So when um, the plane, when the F-15 did the loud thump, what you heard was actually uh, a ricochet. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they have two theories. It's either a true ricochet off the mountains that come back here or uh, he booked it a little too hard in the corner and made a second one. So we're, we're, uh, we'll have to do the, the research and find out which one is the true story. But there were three, three good thumps there. Yeah, a little unexpected, but that's okay. <laughs> that's right. You're supposed to have it. you got to have some variety, right? Yeah, like, just giving people more for their money. Yeah, so for those that maybe didn't tune in yesterday, can you maybe just talk about what the uh, Armstrong Center does at- for NASA. Yeah, so we're the agency's premier high-risk flight research center. So we're flying things that have never been flown before. We're flying faster than most people like to fly. Uh, we're testing things that have never been done. So a lot of the advancements in aviation start at NASA Armstrong and make their way out to commercial aviation. A couple of quick things. If you've flown on a commercial air, airliner, you see the little tips on the wings. Uh, that's a NASA uh, invention. If you're driving down the road and you see a semi with the uh, cone on the top, uh, that was actually tested out here on this dry lake bed by NASA. And so it's kind of an odd thing to make its way to semi trucks, but it, it started here as an aviation thing and made its way out to commercial purposes. That's really cool. And I, I was watching a video this morning about the Bell X-1 team and General Yeager and and all the work that was done by the entire Bell team to break the sound barrier, but but NASA was also a very big part of that, but it was called NAC. I was like, I didn't know that. Yep, the NACA. Um, Yeah, and so shortly after that, we uh, went through a couple of name changes. Oh, that, there's our Heck, I missed my own cue. Uh, but that was our three ship. So if you're watching it, you've got a Gulfstream in the middle and our F-15 and our F-18. Um, yeah, and they're, they'll do a Sonic Boom demo here in just a little bit. Yeah, and so I, I just thought that little harken back to history. But yeah. but much like the Air Force, the theme for this air show is breaking tomorrow's barriers today but you guys are doing that uh, across almost every front that you work on as yes. well that is genuinely our job right we are uh, designed to experiment and test and do new things and break the barriers um, and figure out what's the next thing that needs to be done and so we have a lot of you know tinkerers that uh, like to test their ideas and we have a great space and a great partnership with the the air force here uh, to make it all happen and one of the biggest things you guys are working on, I mean, at least definitely from a public-facing perspective, is that putting someone back on the moon. Yes, I Project mean, Artemis. You know, the moon mission really was given up a long time ago, and it's it's made its rebound. But it, you talked about it yesterday. I was really fascinated. I didn't really realize that it's just... The first step in other steps as well. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the Artemis 1 launch, which is currently scheduled for November 14th, uh, is going to be SLS rocket, which is the space launch system. And we'll send it up. It'll go around the dark side of the moon and come back. We'll go further than we've gone before. So we're super excited about that and get it back on the ground. Two years later, we'll send it up with people. 
and then on the third flight, we will we'll land on the moon. And the idea is that we'll use the resources on the moon to build a lunar outpost that we call Gateway that will float a lot like the International Space Station in low Earth orbit. And then we'll use that as like our, our you know, stop before we go on to Mars. Wow, that's just so cool. And I mean, talk about breaking tomorrow's barriers today. Yeah. That's, that's the definition, Project Artemis, right? Yes, just, <laughs> just taking what we've done in the past and trying to bring it back and do it different and better and, and go where we truly have never gone before, to borrow a line from a, a, a really cool TV show. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, it's it's really awesome as you get a look there at the, the NASA our Gulf Stream. Yeah, and so this aircraft uh, is one of our airborne science aircraft, and what we use it for is uh, normally when it flies for us, it's got instruments hanging off of it, and so our research scientists are trying to collect data. Uh, you know, atmospheric data of all kinds, whether it's related to weather patterns or, you know, uh, pollution, uh, any number of things. And so it flies with all these instrument tubes off of it. Uh, and then inside are all these computers that you can sit there and run the analysis on, on the instruments while you're in flight. And the data comes down and they, they perform all the, the heavy-duty analysis on the ground. And we learn a lot. I mean, these science aircraft are amazing. They're kind of the unsung heroes of NASA, uh, giving us on planet Earth uh, better science every day to make life here on Earth better. And so if you're a young person out there and you're either attending the air show or watching the live stream, you know, it, it's readily apparent. I mean, there are so many cool opportunities in life to work on things that are so much bigger than yourself. Correct. But having that STEM background in science, technology, engineering, math, you know, you can really change the world if you come to the table with those skills. Absolutely. We, we spend a lot of our time and our effort uh, encouraging kids to focus on STEM, right? We want, we need the, we need the math skills. We need the engineering. We need those science-minded individuals that are, you know, all about digging deeper and trying to understand things and, you know, explore places or things that have never been done. And so, if you're interested, if you want to come work at NASA, focus on those those places because we certainly have a lot of work left to do, and we need all, we need everybody coming to the table. And I know you mentioned you had some uh, uh, booths at the STEM Expo. What are some of the things that uh, the kiddos and anybody coming into the STEM Expo can see uh, and learn about NASA over there? Yes, yeah, so you can learn about our X-57 and our X-59. The STEM booth has a ton of great activities for kids. Uh, my favorite is the Mars helicopter that you build out of marshmallows. Um, that's just because I want to eat them all. But I knew it. I, knew <laughs> it. I could tell. <laughs> so... Uh, but there's a lot of uh, like software programming type of activities that uh, when you're young, you don't realize that that's what you're doing, right? We found ways to make it interactive that you're, you're just making the glass ball go around a maze and you don't really realize that you just programmed it. Uh, so it's introducing kids to what, what STEM is in the job life uh, at a young age so it's not quite so scary and you know, feel so heavy. But there's tons to do over there. And I talked with Miss Van Hoyt, the STEM coordinator here at Edwards, and one of the things we talked about was how uh, young people learn today really fits right in with where we're going. It, it it's kind of works hand in hand together. It's kind of cool. And then when maybe you make that connection and the light goes off, voila, your next engineer or pilot or whatever is born. It is definitely the coolest thing to see, whether you're walking around out here and you see a kid light up because they just saw, you know, somebody flying around doing something unbelievable. Or if it's in the STEM Expo and they're, you know, playing around with something and they realize that they can build an air rocket, right? And they, you know, the the idea of finding clicks for them, like the light bulb moment that you talked about, it's that's what we're here for, right? This stuff is amazing, but to see that look in a kid's face when they, it, you know, they finally get it and they get energized and motivated to be a part of it is that's the best part. And I'm being told we're, I don't know, maybe a little over a minute now away from the sonic From foods. the boom. Okay. And what people probably don't realize is you're not going to see those aircraft in the sky because they're really high they're up They're right way now. up there because we were too low, we would break windows. So the first one, the F-15, is going to do a pass, um, and he's going to break the sound barrier, 
normally. And then the F-18 is going to do a, d a dive, a low boom dive. So he's going to invert and then he's going to dive. And the way he's doing that causes the, the waves to go away instead of at us. Um, so you will hear it any minute. Um, and it's the, the second one, the low boom dive maneuver should be a quiet thump, right? The idea is that it's like a car door closing sound wise. Um, and so what we want to do is fly over communities once we've got the X-59 built and test that so that we can open up commercial supersonic flight. Yeah, it'd be nice to fly from L.A. to New York in uh, under six hours. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. So, and, you know, what we want is we want to help American industry stay at the forefront, right? We want to we help our country lead in whatever industry we can help. And so developing these tools, so to speak, and passing them back to industry is, is how we do that. And really, that innovation and that need to, to help industry accomplish the things that they need to do to stay current, really, it's also vital to national strategic competition against our adversaries, and, and NASA is a big part of that as well. Yep, we have great partnership with our, you know, all of our Department of Defense partners. Uh, we work very closely with Edwards. We're, like I said yesterday, we're a tenant here. Um, fantastic partner and having access to the supersonic corridor is critical right and what we develop we you know most of it has an application for the department of defense in something whether it's in their uh aircraft right the years years ago when we developed fly by wire right and then we give now that's now that's in everything out here right so it's a it's a great place for us to test and then give that back to our military so that they can use it um, to keep our our war fighters safe and at the forefront, leading the pack. I'm being told they're diving and inverted now, so we should hear it any time. Yeah, time. you may see, if the weather's just right, you might see a contrail. Um, but I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to jump. <laughs> We're trying to let you hear the boom here. Let's go silent for a minute, see if we can hear it. Said, wait for it. It's coming. Okay, that's that was the second one when we got it first. Can't not that jump. So about 30 seconds later, you should hear the second the thump. And everybody around us jumped as high as <laughs> Megan did. <laughs> I try not to. It looks like such a rookie move. <laughs> there, there was the thud. Was. Wow, I mean, that that is... Yeah, that was really like, cool. I mean, you, like, I mean, I still, I still feel the first one in my ear, right? Yeah. The second one, you just don't even hardly notice, right? The, and the idea is, like I was saying a minute ago, that you cannot currently fly over land at supersonic speeds because you, I mean, you would disturb everything. It's actually very hard on livestock as well, which a lot of people don't think about. You know, you got a bunch of cattle out there, you don't. You know, you don't want to disturb them because it messes a whole lot of things up and uh, a lot of people as well. So if we can figure out how to make that second thump what aircraft experience when they fly supersonic, then maybe we can pass that over to the FAA and change the regulations. And the FAA can open it up and we can all jet off to London in four hours. <laughs> well, that was super cool. And... I know there's one more NASA aircraft that's going to take flight, and we're being told it's really kind of the final, at least it public, is. time of, of taking flight, and that's the Sophia. What does that mean to NASA? So Sophia, is a, she's a love affair for our team, right? She's a very, she holds a very special place in our hearts, and today's a, a mo if you see the NASA crew out here, here in a little bit, they'll probably all be a little somber. Um, but she is going to take off and make her final flight. Uh, back to Palmdale as she's conducted, you know, 
decades of science where you know she was the first to find water on the sunlit portion of the moon. What she does is she flies at about 45,000 feet above 90% of the atmosphere and uh, where the telescope can get a better view. And so she has been a great bridge between uh, the Hubble telescope and James Webb. And um, now that James Webb is up, uh, Sophia is closing down and today will be it. So she'll make a pass uh, one way. On the pass back, you'll see the garage, we call it the garage door, but it's the door where the telescope is. And so you'll get a good look inside at the telescope and uh, she'll, she'll give you a little nod on her way out. And that's the folks here today are going to be the last. Oh man. I mean, but still, I mean, just kind of that step in innovation, right? As we continue to advance and grow and yeah. technology, I don't want to say it becomes outdated, but it just changes and, and it becomes more sophisticated yep. and capabilities increase. Um, that's just how it is. But I know a lot of people have worked on that program oh, for yeah. so long. And, and, you know, so it's a love affair, like yep. you said. Yep. There's a lot of people who put in a lot of hard work on that. So they're sad to see her go. But we're we go next. Uh, so we'll see. We're still waiting to find where. I wanted to give you a, an opportunity to maybe talk about some of the opportunities uh, to come work for NASA and put, you know, that passion and love for STEM to work. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we always, right off the top, we always need electrical, mechanical, and aerospace engineers. So uh, if you're interested in engineering out here at Armstrong, we can definitely use that. And we, we never have enough. Uh, and all of NASA never has enough. So uh, if, if you have an interest in engineering, focus there. We'll, we'll gladly take you. I would also encourage the college students. We have a great internship pathways program. Uh, so look it up. It's on our website. And uh, there they go. Um, but there's a lot of other opportunities as well. It's not just the STEM focus. So if that's not your thing, know that just about any job that you can think of out there, NASA has. Uh, we have big buildings that need to be taken care of. So if you like real estate and construction, we've got a home for you. Uh, if you like the arts, we've got graphics and, and you know writers that develop all of the stories about all the work we're doing. Uh, we, we've from one end of the spectrum to the next, we also have all of our pilots, right? So a lot of our pilots are former test pilots. They come from the military. So, you know, go go spend some time with the military. And when you're done, come hang out with us and fly some of our cool planes. Um, Seems like a pretty good gig. Yeah, I, I'd recommend it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for stopping by. It's been a lot of fun. And I know, you know, air shows like this, uh, obviously, that kind of that high point where you get to kind of show off some of the things that you do. But great work being done at NASA every single day. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. We're just honored to be here and a part of all of this. It's a great opportunity for all of us. All right, so we're going to kick it over to the Air Boss. The Dawn Patrol is next. This 2022 Aerospace Valley Air Show continues. Don't forget the Thunderbirds. They're coming up around 2.30 Pacific Standard Time. So don't go anywhere. More coming up. What are we seeing out in front of us right now? 